Questions. I'm your host, Dr. Dave Layton, and thank you for joining me in our journey to hope. It is my desire through this podcast to bring you information about how to discover, sustain, or perhaps regain hope. It has been a remarkable first year of this podcast. What has been most remarkable is the friends I've made and the friendships I've strengthened as they've provided incredible insights into discovering, sustaining, and regaining hope when faced with incredible situations in life. Well, in this episode, I want to revisit some of the most remarkable points these guests have provided. This is only a representation. My first highlight is from episode 20 with my friend Becky Beggs. We were talking about the power of humor in healing. She chats about how humor is helping in her journey to hope. So uh, I like to define words. And, and so we're talking about humor. And uh, mm -hmm. I looked up some definition. Uh, tendency of experiences to provoke laughter and provide amusement. Okay. And, and we do that. We, we, we laugh yes. at ourselves or situations, uh, all of that. And so uh, I, there was some other interesting definitions. It was a mood or state of mind treatment. You know, when you get a diagnosed for cancer, that's pretty serious. Absolutely. And not just cancer. I, I don't want to dwell just on that. Uh, it can be a family relationship, a lost uh, a, a failed marriage, uh, right. income, lost job, any number of these tragedies in life. And you say, well, how can you find humor in something like that? I want to hear your thoughts on some of this, please. Okay, sure. Well, I completely agree with you that humor, you know, is just so important and it's, and it's not easy. And sometimes the easier thing to do is just let yourself get down and wallow, you know, in self-pity. Um, and, and like I said, I love the definition, the mood or state of mind. The Bible tells us in First Thessalonians, you know, rejoice always or always be joyful. You know, always be joyful, never stop praying, be thankful in all circumstances. So you think, well, always be joyful. Okay, I'm sitting across from an oncologist who says the tests aren't coming back the way we expected. And now we're seeing cancer not only do you have the tumor in your breast, but now we're seeing it in your liver and your bones and in your lungs. Um, so you can't have surgery and, you know, we're going to focus on your quality of life. Okay, well, how do you find joy in that situation? You know, so um, and she and then she left the room and gave Todd and I some time and, and we just cried. And I remember that day. That day was um, was very um well, I remember it vividly. <laughs> Let me just say that. I remember just that feeling of despair. And then my we had gone to my mom's house. And my sister was over there. She, My mom just lives like a mile away. And, um, and I remember my husband and I driving home. And we said, you know, God's got this. God is in charge. And we have the choice as to how we are going to, to deal with this. So for me, gratitude and joy or humor are kind of linked together. Um, it's my choice. I have a choice. When you think of a mood or a state of mind, I have that choice. So am I going to wake up and choose to find the humor and the joy in things? Or am I going to wake up and choose to be negative and grumpy and, and, and those sorts of things? So I decided um, early on that I was going to choose joy and I was going to choose humor because being grumpy or being negative about it doesn't change the fact that I have stage four cancer and that this, this is me, you know, I'm going to deal with this for the rest of my life. So I changed my perspective and thought, okay, I'm going to be positive and I'm going to try and find the humor, be able to laugh at myself, not take myself too seriously. And, um, which, which I've, you know, never really had a problem with, you know, I've never taken myself too seriously, but, um, when I wake up and I have a gratitude journal, when I wake up and I, and I write things that I'm thankful for, sometimes they're silly things, you know, um, 
it doesn't it's it's not always you know that something has just happened that's profound and i go right that i'm thankful for it sometimes i i'm thankful that i woke up i'm thankful that i can see you know i'm thankful when i hear my kids laughing that just I, whatever it is, whatever just hits me that I'm grateful for, I write down. And then that, that uplifts my spirit and makes me joyful and starts my day off so that I'm going to, um, to set my mind to be positive. And I keep that, that gratitude journal out. So throughout the day, if something happens that, that I think, oh, you know, I'm really grateful for that. I go write it. And so I'm, you know, just got my list and, and I'm going to keep going. But not everything is going to be laugh out loud funny, you know, when you're going through this or when you're going through any difficult time, any health diagnosis or like you said, loss, um, whether it be whether it be you've lost someone because they've died or you've lost someone because it's a broken relationship. All of, all of that is trauma. All of that is is hard and difficult times for us. So. When we try to find the humor, sometimes we have to be intentional about it. You know, we have to look for it and um, and just not take life and our circumstances and things too seriously, even even though there are times that we're going to have to take it seriously. Like you said, you know, you and your wife are are more focused on your health and, and things like that now. But still, my circumstances, being grumpy is just going to make everyone around me not want to be around me and make them grumpy. It's not going to take away my cancer. So why be miserable when I don't have to be? This second highlight is from episode 14, where I discuss a key point with Dr. Ryan Fraser from his book, Overcoming the Blues. Dr. Fraser is the coordinator of pastoral care and counseling programs at Fried Hardman University. He also has a private counseling practice specializing in depression, anxiety, OCD, addictions, and marriage relationships. You also state that one of the most effective strategies of coping with depression and related things is to shift focus away yeah. from yourself and turn it to others and their needs. Oh, brother, amen. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, we're, as as believers, we're called to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow Christ. And and um, so this, in the middle of this theology of, of their suffering while we're on this earth, we're, we're going to suffer. And... Um, in the middle of that, being able to serve, not serve, not despite our depression or despite our struggle, but but serve through it and use it in a way that gives us access to people, other people in ways that we might not otherwise have. And I think about the Apostle Paul in Second uh, Corinthians twelve. He talks about this thorn in the flesh. We're not sure if that was his eyesight or what it was. Having been stoned several times, very well could have been. But um, but the, the his statement for when I'm weak, then I'm strong, and um, my strength is his strength is made perfect in in weakness. Um, the the idea of the the more we're relying on the Lord and serving. Uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul, had such a servant's heart um, as a, a missionary and and a person that genuinely loved people and their souls. In, in the middle, you know, having or struggling with depression or anxiety, I, I, I use the illustration of my wife. And I've gone speaking different uh, places around the country, just how because of her own uh, clinical depression, issues it it kind of it's it's given her a built-in radar where she's able to she picks up on things that in other people picks up on struggles they might be trying to conceal and um is is a it's like a magnet it's this uh this way of of connecting um uh, because of the, the you know the shared the shared struggle and um, the, the issue with serving 
and she was a school counselor for a long time. So okay. we'd we'd go we'd go to Walmart or Dollar General, and children would come up to her, and I mean, she was just a rock star, <laughs> you know, um, okay. because because of the way that she served, you know, those kids and. I make the comment often, I'm just like a groupie when she's around. I mean, they, you know, they see her and, and the way that she's ministered and, and to them in some of these kid parents have died of tumor, brain tumors and things like that. So being able to serve, not kind of come back, not, not in spite of our struggle, but the exact opposite because of it, it sensitizes us and we can serve and we can help others, we can listen, we can do more hands-on service in a way that's very meaningful, very life-giving to us, as well as to them. Um, great illustration, um, Bailey Howell, who played for um, uh, basketball Mississippi State back in the 50s. They went on and played for the Celtics. Uh, Bailey Howell grew up not too far from here in, in Middleton, Tennessee, and um, mem faithful member of the church. I, I bumped into Bailey at, in Starkville um, at, at church there, and um, uh, one of my friends told him about the book I, you know, had coming out, and and uh, Bailey in his in his 80s now. I mean, he all star in the Celtics, uh, second draft pick behind Will Chamberlain. I mean, just wow. incredible. Okay. Um, all right, so I'm talking to Bailey, and uh, he found out about you know my my topic, my my book, and he said, "Look," he said, "when he said when he said Ryan, when I got out of the the NBA, he said after I left the NBA, he said um, my life had been basketball. Mm -hmm. I mean everything about it that was my identity." And he said for about six to nine months, he said, yeah, he said I, he went into this deep dark depression. He couldn't even leave his house. It was so bad, and uh, so he, you know, he was in his thirties at that time. And he said, finally, one day he realized. He said, I, I, I can't, I can't sit here anymore. I've got to get out. So he got out, and he started mowing widows, widows in the church and the community. He'd, he'd go mow their yard. But wow. he was a, you know, world class basketball player. So yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I'd, I'd kid, he'd clean out the gutters, which wasn't too big of a deal. He didn't, he didn't need a ladder. He's six foot ten. He just put his hand up there. And, you know. <laughs> okay. But but he said the one thing that pulled him out of that depression was taking his eyes off himself and finding meaning and purpose in serving other people. Yeah. And I thought, man, that's that's what it's all about, you know. And um, that story repeats itself over and over where yeah. we we look look to those that uh, can use our help and we find such such a great not just distraction but uh great purpose renewed purpose and and a reason for being that god is not uh, god's not through with me yet this third highlight is from episode 16 where i discuss with steve and janet johnson about putting hope into motion Steve and Janet give of themselves in many ways, especially when folks have their hope challenged because of life situations. They're active in helping with disaster relief, among other areas. They teach various workshops on multiple spiritual and secular topics to strengthen and encourage others. Steve is an author, having written several books, some spiritual, some entertaining, but all encouraging others in life. And so you meet people in, in your travels uh, where, yeah, they're just faced not just disasters or not just illness, just things in life that affect them. Let, let's kind of start out by talking about um, some of your thoughts on what hope is. Some people uh, view hope as a kind of a vague wishing that they, they simply wait around. I really, really have a lot of hope about this, but... They wait around and, and don't put anything into action. And, and I, I feel like that's a bit of a mistaken view. And so that's what I want to hear your thoughts on. Well, I would say um, I, I grew up playing a lot of sports and I've, I've played football from 
I guess probably age seven through high school. And um, so I use a lot of sports analogies and metaphors. And um, but I think back to my playing days and and whenever we started a season, uh, we were very hopeful. And you know, you want to you want to do well as a as a an individual player. You want your team to do well. You want to maybe win the championship or whatever. And so you have uh, you could say you have hope for that. But I think that hope is uh, rooted in preparation. So the reason you have hope as a, a as a football player is that you have spent time, you know, in practice. You've spent time studying the playbook. You've run sprints, uh, you know, to work on your conditioning. You've spent time in the weight room, and you have a coach that has a, you know, a game plan. You trust the coach. You trust the plan. You trust your your conditioning and preparation. And so all those things come together, and you have this sense of hope for the season. Um, I would not have been nearly as hopeful each season if I had not done anything. If I had just sat around saying, well, I, I hope we, we win a lot of games, but I'm not willing to practice or spend time in the weight room or st- spend time studying the playbook. And so I, I kind of think about that in, in terms of the Christian faith. And we all as Christians want to have a uh, a, a fulfilling, meaningful life. We want to have hope in the Lord. We want to have hope for the, the future. Um, but I think that is rooted in some 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 things we need to do. We need to be uh, in prayer. Uh, we need to be in Bible study. We need to be in fellowship with other Christians. And um, that, that deep faith that we want to develop uh, does not come from sitting around and just having this vague sense of hope. It comes from uh, those spiritual disciplines and being in the word and being in prayer. And we also have a, a coach, uh, God or Jesus who has a, uh, an awesome game plan, uh, in the Bible. And so, uh, so I think it's, uh, it, there, there's a hope for the future. There's a hope in, in the promises of God. And then, and then there's also this idea that I'm hopeful because of the preparation that I have put in as a Christian and, you know, those Christian graces that I try to work on every day. Well, I would just reiterate that, I mean, our hope comes from the sacrifice that Jesus did for our, for our sakes. If there was no sacrifice, there would be no hope. And to me, that's what, when times are hard and when you're sick or you're lost your RV or whatever it is may that you may be going through, have cancer, whatever it is, that is what is your driving hope is that you know that that sacrifice was given to you for a reason. And that reason is so that we can spend eternity with God in heaven. Yeah. And Steve, I appreciate, and Janet, I'm sorry, I appreciate both of those thoughts. Uh, Janet, your uh, information about that being in Christ. Well, that's true hope. That's sustained hope. Right. Uh, And that's the hope that we learn in scripture about, confident assurance as opposed to the wishful thinking. This next highlight is from episode 21, where I'm speaking with John Mark Stevenson about finding hope in a world of fear. John Mark is part of the ministry team at the Prattville Church of Christ in Prattville, Alabama. He serves primarily to minister to our young married couples and young adults as they're growing their families and beginning to make their way in the world. You know, the other verse I want to speak to, though, and and you really touched on it well, is in Romans 8, 31. uh, If God is for us, who can be against us? Praise God for that hope-filled verse. A really hope-filled verse. You know, I think Paul is calling us to, in this verse, to think and really reflect on, on, on the deep implications of what even what he just said before this verse. So if you go back and look at what he, he talked about before this verse, he, he's, he's basically asking us a question. Um, if God is for us, who can be against us? And why he's asking that question is because of what he's said before. Um, you know, he doesn't just simply st- to ask these verses, but he hurls these questions out in um, into this space where he is trying to get us to think of, okay, I've said all these things before, now don't you understand the God that you serve is going to be for you? God is your sovereign protector, right? So he's he, he's the answer to that question that God is for us who can be against us. Paul's question is, first of all, is, is who's against us, right? So who's against us? That, that doesn't mean, suggest that, you know, 
if God is for us, that we're not going to have any adversaries. It doesn't mean that, you know, if you think in verses 35 and 36 describes all sorts of, of, of different adversaries and enemies and opposition. Um, his point here isn't that we're not going to have those. What his point is, is that because we have God, he uses verse 28, all things work together for our good, right? For those according, uh, for those called according to his purpose. What he's saying is here that, that, that if we are a child of God, the things that he mentioned are in no comparison against God. The things that are, you know, if we face in our life, health, financial crisis, um, things that are all coming to, to rob us of hope, the things that are putting fear in our life because we're fearing of, you know, what is going to happen in the future. He's saying those things do not have to rob you because if God is for us, those things have no power. Paul is countering fear right here that we face. Fear of, of the forces that, that, that are trying to, to group together um, to, you know, maybe it's ridicule or rejection or hostility, disdain, or, or even death, right? So, you know, talking about as we move in our lives, um, we may face things in our life that, that we're fear of death, and, and death can be a, a very fearful thing. But what Paul is saying, and even in those moments, you have a God that fearfully and wonderfully made you. And he's wanting you to have a hope, even to the point that death may be knocking. This final highlight is from episode 13. I'm speaking with Jason Green about finding hope through prayer. Jason is also part of our ministry team for the Prattville Church of Christ. He serves primarily as our youth minister. Prayer is always encouraged as we face challenges to hope. Jason gives insights into what prayer is, who it's for, and how we can discover, sustain, or regain hope through prayer. I would like to know your thoughts on prayer. Well, I, I, think, I think our society has kind of hurt us on our thoughts on prayer because we live in an instantaneous world. Uh, when it comes to music, when it comes to movies, when it comes to, I guess I can say, restaurants on, on this podcast. I mean, when it comes to Chick-fil-A, when it comes to Amazon and things like that, sure. that, that we order something or we want something. And, you know, it's on the DVR at home. It's the click of a button, push of a mouse. And, and it just happens, and it's there, and we have it. And prayer is one of those things that we kind of expect the same results when we pray tonight, we get up in the morning expecting things to have changed overnight. And my timetable and God's timetable may be two completely different timetables. I may not be ready for what I'm praying for. That may not be God's direction, the things that I'm praying for. That may not be the way God wants me to go. And so sometimes that... I would view that lack of response, per se, that I view as God, is that my prayer is not working. The prayer may be in motion, and God's working on it, yeah. but I want that answer just instantaneous. As soon as I pray, uh, I, I want it to be there. And, and so for a long time, I thought prayer was about the words and the verbiage. And, and, you know, we say a lot of things in our prayers, uh, bring us back at the next appointed time, guide, guard, and protect. And, and we have these, these certain catchphrases that we say and that a lot of people do. And for a long time, that's what I thought prayer was, is you had to say the right words and come up with the right things. But prayer to me is really just about pouring my heart out to God about the things that I need, about the things that I want, about the desires and the struggles that I'm having, but also thanking him for everything that he's done, thanking him for the blessings that I have, thanking you, him for the, the hard times he's gotten me through and he's seen me through. So, so prayer is this dual entity, if you will, I guess, for lack of a better word, that I'm I'm requesting, but I'm also praising God, too, for what he's done. And so prayer to me is, uh, I don't know how long this podcast is, four or five hours maybe, to talk about this subject of prayer, but, but I mean, there are a lot of thoughts that are there. Yeah. 
but I'm not dealing with that. I'm not going through that. And to me, the answer is pray about it. And to you, the response is, I've been praying about it. And I haven't seen an answer, therefore my prayer is not working. And that's not necessarily true. And thinking about prayer and learning to pray, I used to have the idea, what right do I have to pray? Because I'm the servant. I'm the slave. I serve the master. My entire existence needs to be, what does the master want? And not only are you the servant, but you're the child as well that that has a father that cares about you that loves you that that wants what's best for you and and that's a fine line to try to split to try to navigate is being that servant where you have that in the garden that same thought as jesus father not my will but your will but but god here's here's what i want and and here's what i'm what I'm needing and can open a door, point me in a direction that that I need to go, that, that servant and that child. And it's hard because we have that right because the Bible talks about let us come boldly yeah. before the throne of God. Now that's not arrogant no, and that's arrogant. not right. not conceited, but that, that assurance that hey, I'm going to ask, God's going to hear and God's going to answer according to to his will and to, to his plan and according to his direction, not necessarily mine. But it also becomes hard for me as an individual, and, and I'm just talking about Jason here, it becomes hard for me to accept sometimes the answer to that prayer because that's not the outcome I wanted. Right. That's not how I saw this playing out. Friends, thank you for joining me as I bring back some of the highlights from 2023. You can listen to the full episodes and others on the podcast. It has been a joy to launch this podcast to help others discover, sustain, or regain hope, as many of us have. I also invite you to continue listening as together we journey to hope. Also, please share this podcast with someone whose hope is being challenged. I invite you, as always, to contact me if you have questions or comments, or you wish to share with me something you've experienced in your journey to hope. My email is ourjourneytohope at gmail.com. That's our journey and the number two, hope at gmail.com. I look forward to a wonderful new year as together we continue our journey. Again, thank you for listening. And until our next episode, remember, we give all glory to God our Father.